After asking for a divorce and starting proceedings, my husband, 32M, is now begging me to take him back. What do I, 31F, do? Never imagined that I'd be in this position. For years of marriage, and despite the ups and downs, I always thought we had a solid relationship. My husband, Daniel, was my partner in every way. I loved him, trusted him, and thought we were building a future together. But a few months ago, he blindsided me by asking for a divorce. Now he's begging for a second chance, and I have no idea what to do. It all started one evening after work. I was cooking dinner when Daniel sat me down with a serious look on his face. I assumed it was about something trivial, maybe something work-related. But then, he handed me divorce papers. I couldn't process it at first. The words blurred together, and I kept thinking, this can't be real. My heart was pounding, and I stared at him, waiting for him to laugh or say it was a joke, but the silence was crushing. When I finally managed to ask him why, he avoided eye contact and muttered something about us growing apart. He said he still cared about me but didn't love me anymore. His words were a knife to the heart. How could he feel like this and never say anything? How could we get to the point of divorce without even trying to fix things? I was devastated, but I didn't beg him to stay. I was too hurt, and his detached attitude just made it worse. That night, I couldn't bear to sleep in the same bed, so I curled up on the couch replaying every moment of our relationship in my mind. Where did it go wrong? What had I missed? The next few days were a blur of emotions. I was angry, sad, and confused. I thought about our lives after marriage, how work had taken over both of us. We both got promotions shortly after the wedding, which meant more responsibilities and less time for each other. My father's terminal illness added another layer of stress. I visited him often, and Daniel never complained, but it was clear we were living parallel lives, not an intertwined one. Still, he never talked to me about his feelings. There was no conversation, no attempt to fix things. He just dropped the divorce on me like a bomb, and that was it. I felt like he had already given up long before I even had the chance to fight for us. A few days later, after thinking it over, I decided that I couldn't be with someone who didn't love me. No matter how much it hurt, I had to respect his decision and let go. I agreed to proceed with the divorce. It wasn't an easy choice, but it was the only one that made sense. My family was supportive, but naturally, they were sad for me. His parents, on the other hand, sent me long, heartfelt messages, urging me to give him another chance. I couldn't, though. I wasn't going to beg for his love. Over the next few months, we remained cordial. Daniel moved in with his brother, and I stayed in our house. Our interactions were civil, even friendly at times, but I kept my distance emotionally. I didn't want to reopen old wounds. At one of our meetings to discuss the proceedings, he casually mentioned going on a blind date. It stung to hear it, even though I knew our relationship was over. Part of me still cared, but I told myself this was just another step in moving on. That all changed last week. It was a regular evening. I was watching TV when the doorbell rang. When I opened the door, there stood Daniel, his eyes red and puffy from crying, with his brother by his side. I was shocked. He started begging, literally begging, for me to take him back. He was crying, telling me he made a mistake, that he still loved me, and that he had been wrong to ask for a divorce. The scene felt surreal, like it was happening to someone else. I stood there, frozen, trying to process his words. I ended up telling them both to leave. I wasn't ready to deal with this emotional chaos, not after everything I had been through. After they left, my phone started buzzing with voicemail after voicemail from Daniel. His messages were full of sobbing apologies, promises to make things right. My best friend suggested that maybe the blind date went horribly wrong, and now he was panicking. Maybe he realized how much he lost after trying to date again. But I didn't know what to believe. Since then, he hasn't stopped trying to contact me. He's been calling, texting, showing up at the house, doing everything he can to convince me to take him back. 
He keeps saying we can stop the divorce proceedings since the final order hasn't been issued yet. But I feel torn. I'm insulted, honestly. He started this whole mess. He's the one who dropped the bomb on me and forced me to go through months of emotional turmoil. And now he thinks he can just turn everything around like nothing ever happened? The worst part is, I'm not even sure why he wants me back. Does he truly realize he made a mistake? Or is he just afraid of being alone? Is he trying to undo this because of me? Or because his date didn't work out and now he's regretting it? These questions keep spinning in my head, and I don't know what to believe. Our mutual friends are split. Some think I should give him another chance, that maybe he's really seen the error of his ways. Others say I'd be crazy to take him back after everything he put me through. And here I am, stuck in the middle, unsure of what to do. On one hand, a part of me still loves him. We had years of good memories before things went wrong, and it's hard to throw that all away. But on the other hand, I feel like he betrayed my trust in the worst way. How do you just move on from someone telling you they don't love you? How do I know he won't do it again? I've spent so much time over these past months learning to live without him, trying to find myself again. I've built a life where I can see a future without Daniel, where I'm no longer relying on him for my happiness. Do I really want to risk all of that to take him back? Maybe what's hardest is that I've started to heal. I've begun to accept the idea of a life without him, a new chapter for myself. I've gained strength from the pain and found a sense of independence I didn't realize I had lost. Going back now feels like stepping backward, like I'd be undoing all the progress I've made. I don't know what to do. I want to believe that people can change, that maybe this is a turning point for him, but at the same time, I don't want to lose myself in the process of trying to fix something that's already broken. If I take him back, it needs to be because I believe in us, not because I feel guilty or pressured by him or anyone else. For now, I'm holding my ground. I've told him I need space to think, but I'm starting to realize that my answer might already be clear. Maybe we've reached the point of no return, and the best thing I can do is continue down the path I've started, one where I find myself, even if it means leaving him behind. My 32F boyfriend, 36M, deleted my dead brother from my Instagram friends, and he doesn't seem to understand or care that I'm upset. Six years ago, I lost my twin brother, Sam, in a tragic car accident. It was one of the largest accidents in our state, and the details still haunt me. The only solace I've clung to is that Sam died instantly. According to the police, he probably didn't even realize what was happening around him before it was all over. That thought, though horrifying, has brought me some strange comfort over the years. Before his death, Sam was a huge social media user. Instagram was his favorite. He wasn't a typical influencer, but his posts were genuine and filled with the people and things he loved. Friends, family, music, he loved singing and was incredibly talented. His account became the snapshot of who he was. Thousands of posts about his life, filled with his voice, his presence, everything I missed about him after he was gone. I found myself revisiting his Instagram account often after the accident. It became a kind of ritual for me, especially late at night when I felt the weight of his absence the most. His videos, especially the ones where he was teaching English to ESL students, were like tiny windows into the past. I would play them and pretend, just for a moment, that he was talking to me. I know it wasn't the healthiest thing to do. I've been told as much by my family, by friends, even by therapists, but it helped me cope with his loss. It wasn't every day and I wasn't obsessing. It was just my small connection to him, a way to keep his memory alive. My boyfriend, Jay, came into my life two years ago. He never knew Sam. He didn't witness the depth of the bond Sam and I shared, nor did he understand the pain I went through when I lost him. I always tried to explain it to him, how it felt like I lost a part of myself that day, but Jay seemed to view grief in a more transactional way. His philosophy was that you grieve, you heal, and then you move on. Simple as that. So when he found out that I was still visiting Sam's Instagram, he started encouraging me to stop. He told me I needed to let go and that this wasn't a healthy way to keep Sam's memory alive. At first, I tried to explain why it mattered to me. 
how it wasn't about clinging to the past but about remembering the person I loved. But Jay was persistent. He kept urging me to break free, to move forward, and I started to listen to him. I cut down the time I spent on my brother's page. I reduced the videos I watched. Some nights, I didn't visit his account at all, trying to shift my focus to the present. It wasn't easy, but I thought I was making progress on my own terms. And then last night happened. I was lying in bed, scrolling through Instagram before sleep, when I decided to check Sam's page. I hadn't been on his account in days, maybe even weeks, so I figured I'd watch one video and then call it a night. But when I searched for his name, nothing came up. His account was gone. I was instantly panicked. I texted my sister to see if she could still find his account, and she confirmed she could see it just fine. Confused and anxious, I turned to Jay, asking if he had any idea what happened. That's when he casually admitted that he had blocked Sam's account on my phone. I was stunned. I didn't even know how to react at first. Blocking Sam? My dead brother? He said it like it was nothing, like it was some minor inconvenience he had fixed for me. When I asked why, his response was even worse than the act itself. He said he did it because he thought I was in love with my brother. He even went as far as to suggest I had some sick, twisted attraction to Sam, that I was unable to let him go because of these inappropriate feelings. He accused me of things I can't even bring myself to repeat. I was disgusted. My twin brother, my other half, the person I grew up with, shared my life with, went to college with. At the time of his accident, we were even living together as roommates. And Jay's twisted mind had turned my grief into something sick. I wanted to vomit. He didn't stop there. Jay kept telling me that I was the one who needed help, that my connection to Sam was unhealthy, and that blocking him was the best thing he could have done for me. When I tried to explain how much it hurt me, he brushed me off, acting like I was overreacting. I could feel my world spinning, like I was suddenly grieving Sam all over again. Not just because his memory had been tainted by these accusations, but because I realized Jay wasn't capable of understanding my loss. He never could. The real kicker came when I tried to undo the block. Since my brother's account was private, and we hadn't been able to access it since his death, there was no way for me to re-follow him. That window into his life, the one place I could still feel connected to him, was now locked shut forever. My brother was truly gone from me, and it felt like Jay had stolen that last piece of him from me. When I told Jay what he'd done, his response was callous. You should just move on, he said. It's not a big deal, but it was to me. It was everything. And that's when I realized that we were done. I'm now left with this gaping hole, feeling like I've lost my brother all over again. Jay took away something that was sacred to me, something he had no right to touch. I don't know if I can forgive him for that. He keeps telling me to let it go, that it's just Instagram, but it's not. It's my brother. It's the voice I'll never hear again. The memories I can never get back. Our mutual friends are telling me to forgive him, to move past it, but I don't think I can. I see now that Jay doesn't understand grief. He doesn't understand that love and loss are intertwined, and you don't just move on when someone you love dies. You carry that loss with you. It becomes a part of who you are. And in his ignorance, Jay violated that part of me. I'm still processing all of this, but I know one thing for sure. This relationship is over. I can't be with someone who doesn't respect my grief, who doesn't understand the depth of my love for my brother. I thought I was done grieving, but it turns out I'm still in the middle of it. And now I have to grieve the loss of a relationship too. I won the lottery, and it ruined my relationship with my boyfriend and my family. Winning the lottery was always something I imagined would change my life for the better. Who doesn't dream of hitting that magical jackpot and leaving all their worries behind? But here I am, with more money than I ever imagined, and my life feels like it's crumbling piece by piece. It all started just a few months ago. I was in line at the store, buying a few essentials after a tough week at work. On a whim, I picked up a lottery ticket. It was one of those why not moments. I never expected to win. I barely even remembered I had bought the ticket until I saw the winning numbers flash across the news later that night. At first, I thought I must be mistaken. But no, after checking a dozen times, I realized it was real. I had just won $600,000. At first, 
the excitement was overwhelming. I felt like all my problems had suddenly vanished. I immediately called my boyfriend, Jay, and when he rushed over, he was just as thrilled. We both jumped up and down, laughing, dreaming about how this would change everything. We talked about vacations, paying off debt, even giving some money to charity. For a brief moment, it was pure bliss, but that feeling didn't last long. The crack started with Jay. In the beginning, we both talked about how to use the money responsibly, but soon enough, he started making plans on his own. He wanted to quit his job immediately, buy a luxury car, and invest in one of his friend's new business ventures. It felt like he was already living in a fantasy, spending the money in his head before it even hit our account. When I suggested we take things slow, maybe consult a financial advisor, he seemed insulted. He got defensive, accusing me of trying to control everything. You don't trust me, he said. I tried explaining that I wasn't saying no. I just wanted us to be smart about it, but he couldn't hear me. Then came my family. We've never been particularly close. My relationship with my parents had always been strained, and my sister, let's just say we've had our differences. But suddenly, they were all over me. My parents started reaching out more than they had in years, and while at first I thought they just wanted to reconnect, it didn't take long for the money talk to start. Subtle at first, comments about how tough things were for them financially, how their mortgage payments were overwhelming. I could feel the unspoken expectation growing with every conversation. My sister was far less subtle. She outright demanded that I share the money with her. I've always supported you, she said. You owe me for all those times I had your back. But that wasn't true. If anything, she's always been the one trying to one-up me, making me feel small at every opportunity. And now she was acting like I was selfish for not handing over the cash. With Jay and my family both pulling at me from different sides, I felt trapped. The person I thought I could rely on, Jay, was growing more distant by the day. He started spending time with friends who I barely knew, people who seemed more interested in his access to money than in him. He'd come home late, smelling of alcohol, and when I confronted him about it, we'd argue. His spending habits were spiraling out of control, and I didn't recognize the person he was becoming. The breaking point came when Jay asked me to invest a huge chunk of the winnings into a business venture one of his new friends was starting. I didn't trust it. It sounded sketchy, like a get-rich-quick scheme. When I told him no, he lost it. He accused me of being selfish, of not believing in him, of caring more about the money than about our relationship. We had the worst fight of our lives, and he stormed out. He didn't come back for days. During that time, my family's demands got more aggressive. My parents were now acting like they were entitled to the money, saying things like, We raised you. The least you could do is help us out now. My sister called me every name in the book, accusing me of abandoning my family just because I had money. It was exhausting. When Jay finally returned, he was calmer, but things between us had fundamentally shifted. We sat down to talk, and it became clear that our relationship had been poisoned by greed and resentment. We decided to break up. I gave him a parting sum of money to avoid more drama, and he moved out. As I watched him go, I didn't feel relief, I felt empty. I realized I hadn't just lost him. I had lost the relationship we once had, the love that was supposed to be above all else. Now I'm sitting here, alone with my fortune. My family barely speaks to me unless they're trying to guilt me into giving them more money. My boyfriend, the person I thought I'd build a life with, is gone, along with whatever dreams we once shared. I've hired a financial advisor to manage the money and a therapist to manage my sanity, but the emotional toll is heavier than I ever imagined. But here's where things get really strange. Just when I thought my life couldn't get more complicated, I got a call. A lottery representative informed me that there had been an error in the prize distribution. Turns out, my winnings were actually a clerical mistake. Instead of $600,000, the real amount I won was only $60,000. The real shock wasn't the money itself. It was realizing how much I had lost over a simple misunderstanding. The people I loved showed their true colors over a sum that wasn't even what we thought. Jay had left me, 
My family had turned against me, and now, with this revelation, it felt like the joke was on all of us. In the end, I was left with a fraction of the fortune we all fought over. I had let money, or at least the idea of it, destroy my relationship and fracture my family. It turned out that it wasn't the money that ruined everything. It was how we let it change us. And now I'm sitting here, wishing I could go back to when things were simpler, when love and trust meant more than dollar signs. But I know that's impossible. So, what do I have left? A lesson. One that cost me far more than I ever could have imagined.